I'm going to turn it over to um, the experts in the room to introduce themselves and take it over from here. Hi, I'm Deb Covington, Information Security and Privacy Office with DHS. I'm Carla Monroe, Information Security and Privacy Office with DHS. And Brad Horn from the Attorney General's Office. I work with Deb and Carla on a pretty much daily basis dealing with HIPAA breaches and information requests and things like that. Great. So I will just, quick introduction. So those of you who are on this call, as you know, um, many of you have blended funds. So some of you get funded by DHS and you also get funded by public health and you might get some funded, funding through Early Childhood Iowa and a number of sources. And really this is just to provide an overview of some of the unique things about money from DHS and some of the requirements we have as a HIPAA organization. So um, they're going to go through their materials and then hopefully have some time for question and answer. All right. I'll start off. So uh, yeah, Lisa had asked us to kind of get together a, a presentation for you guys, um, a bit of a simplica simplification of some of the presentations that we had done before. Uh, for me, I've got about 20 minutes to tell you everything I know about HIPAA, and in the spare time, we'll play Pictionary or something. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the first part is kind of just the basics. The second part that Deb and Carla will address is more what you really need to do to comply with HIPAA and those obligations. Um, big question that people ask sometimes is, why do we even have HIPAA? Um, and the fact is, in the late 80s, early 90s, there were no protections for healthcare information at a federal level. Um, there were some really bad examples from way back when of, uh, for instance, the, the one that stands out in my mind uh, was an OBGYN who sold birth records to Fisher Price. And there was no law that would prohibit that at all. And a lot of other bad activity, activity happening uh, across the country. Uh, and again, there was no federal law protecting a patient's privacy and their healthcare information unless, you know, you might run across one uh, in a particular state, but uh, nothing at the federal level. So in 1996, uh, Congress got together, and you kind of think of the time frame here. This was just after the Clinton Healthcare Initiative and that failure. There was a realization that something needed to be done at a federal level. Um, and HIPAA is a whole lot more than just uh, patient privacy. If you look at the title of it, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, a big focus of the law was making sure that you could transition from one job to the other without losing health care coverage. Uh, one of the, the big issues being addressed about this time was the fact that there were in excess of 400 different data standards uh, that were used by healthcare providers and healthcare providers, healthcare plan. So, for instance, a provider might have to put their data in one particular format to speak to principal computers, and a different format to speak to United Healthcare computers. And so, it was becoming a bit of a mess. And uh, a thought at the federal level was there needed to be standardization. And with that, a lot of interest groups stepped in and said. If you're going to regulate, you also need to address the privacy issues as we move more into an electronic health healthcare system in the country. So that was 96. Uh, the first set of federal regulations came out in 2003. Uh, they, they addressed both the, the privacy rule as well as what's called the security rule and some basics of what um, entities that are covered by HIPAA really need to do to make sure that uh, they're protecting both the, the privacy and security of patient information. And kind of as a tangent to that, there's also the enforcement rule. And the original set of regulations, the original statute included some criminal sanctions, uh, as well as some ability to fine entities that uh, were doing bad things with healthcare information. You didn't see a lot of activity either in the civil or criminal context uh, under that original set of regulations, um, but that has changed substantially. After the 10-year anniversary of those regulations in 2013, they were revamped by HHS and now have some very strong enforcement authority of HHS that they use. The, the regulations today, kind of where the rubber hits the road in my mind, is uh, 45 CFR Part 160 through Part 164. Those are all the HIPAA regulations. There's the underlying statutory framework as well and the criminal sanctions that are written into a different part of the federal code. But 
this is the important stuff that we work with on a daily basis. Part 160 sets out some definitions that you really need to understand HIPAA, as well as enforcement authority. So when you screw up, that's where you need to go to look and see what you have to do. Uh, 162 is where you find the transaction standards. And so when you're dealing with like a Medicaid program uh, and an MCO, they'll they'll speak in lingo of, hey, I'll, I'll send you my 834 file and the response to that is an 835. Those are standardized transactions that the entities are using to communicate and they're regulated pursuant to this part 162. Uh, the rules about the national provider identifier are in 162 and a lot of other stuff as well. Uh, and then 164 is really the nuts and bolts of HIPAA that Deb and I work with uh, almost daily. And that's the, the security rule, the, the privacy rule, um, that lay out what you're allowed to do with healthcare information. Um, new in 2013 was the obligation to provide notice to patients when you do bad things with their information. So a ton of stuff there. So HIPAA uses the lingo of a covered entity. Uh, to describe who has to comply with HIPAA at a basic level. And uh, don't worry too much about the lingo. The word or the phrase covered entity is used both in HIPAA and other federal laws as well. It's just trying to es establish who has to do this. And there are three buckets of entities that have to comply with HIPAA. The first is a healthcare clearinghouse. Those are kind of the middleman between healthcare providers and healthcare uh, plans and they normalize data for those two entities so their computers can talk to one another. Uh, we hardly ever hear about breaches with healthcare clearinghouses. Healthcare plans, those are Principal, United, Amerigroup, uh, you know, HMOs. Um, if a company has a healthcare plan that they're running individually, then that would be covered. You can see in the list there that Medicaid, Medicare, those are expressly covered health plans. And that's why DHS largely gets picked up there are pieces of DHS that is also a healthcare provider. So if you look at the far left column, um, generally any provider, doctor, psychologist, anything that fits into kind of that bucket of a healthcare provider is going to have to comply with HIPAA as well. Uh, but notice the red box at the bottom of that column. Uh, it says that, uh, you know, yes, those Providers are covered, but only to the extent they transmit information in an electronic form in connection with the transaction that HHS has adopted a standard for. The reason for that is really constitutional. The, there's limitations on what the federal government can do and laws that it couldn't put in place. And its justification for putting HIPAA in place was what's called the Commerce Clause. And so Congress has the ability to regulate things that move between the states. So they needed stuff crossing state lines so that they could regulate it. So they said, okay, we're gonna regulate the ones and zeros that cross over the internet and, and you know bounce around the country as healthcare information is passed back and forth. Um, so totally local activity can't be regulated at the federal level. That's kind of the basics of that and why they did it that way. Uh, what you have because of that is you find pockets of say dentists uh, in Iowa who say, I'm never gonna accept anything electronic from anybody in relation to a uh, healthcare bill. I'll, I'll bill Medicaid and paper. Uh, and what they're doing is trying to avoid the obligation of complying with HIPAA. So just keep that in mind. HIPAA doesn't cover everything in the world. Only certain entities have to comply with it. And covered entities themselves can decide that, well, they don't want to be fully covered, maybe they have a component that has to be covered by HIPAA because it's a health plan, but they decide, hey, we're gonna carve that out and set it off to the side. Uh, that th Those pieces that have to deal with HIPAA, we'll let them deal with HIPAA, the rest of us will move on with life. Uh, Department of Human Services, and I apologize, this is maybe oh, a, it. Oh, you want to yeah. say that? I, I said we, what I meant to say. Okay. <laughs> It has the right governor at the top, awesome. So this is a chart of DHS, and everything that you see in green is part of the covered entity. And there are small bits and pieces that are carved out. So the the CUSO, the, the sex offender uh, facility, doesn't bill Medicaid. It doesn't, it can't bill Medicaid because it's more of a jail than a treating facility. 
I shouldn't have said that, but it's probably true. Um, we are being recorded, Brad. I know. Um, <laughs> There are pieces of DHS that constitute schools, and schools have to comply with FERPA. They don't necessarily have to comply with HIPAA, and so anything that constitutes a school that fits under the purview of, of the umbrella of DHS, they've decided they want to deal with FERPA, not HIPAA. So, um, so DHS is a is a hybrid entity as designated in its administrative rules, and this is a, a designation that an entity has to make formally in writing somewhere that you're you're carving out pieces. And what this means too is that, well, we can't necessarily share covered information, information that's protected by HIPAA with the governor. So if the governor has a constituent that's complaining and she sends a, a query to Director Foxhoven, the response back can't be patient specific unless we jump through some hoops of HIPAA. And I'll just take one moment to note the Division of Adult Child and Family Services, which is where the contracts for prevention come out of, is one of those uh, covered divisions. Absolutely. So, next piece, and I'm not sure that, can you guys see the entire slides? It's supposed to say business associates at the top. Yeah, can we get rid of that Um, I think you can move it. That shows. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Carla. Yeah, put it down there. Yeah, good job. There you go. Okay, so uh, business associates. Uh, when the law was originally passed, uh, the the concept was it was to apply to entities that are covered by HIPAA. When the first set of regulations came out, there was a lot of public comment around the idea that, well, wait a minute, you know, you've got a healthcare provider who has to protect the patient information, but when that healthcare provider sends data off to an accountant, it's no longer protected, and that's not fair. So uh, the final set of regulations that came out from HHS in 2003 and 2004 included a new category of businesses or entities that had to comply with HIPAA, and those are called business associates. And so that's somebody who's under contract with a covered entity. They're doing something for the covered entity pursuant to that contract, so accounting, fraud detection, billing, running part of a like a Department of Human Services program, uh, anything that really requires access to information that's covered by HIPAA, that entity is supposed to be a business associate. And so if your business associate, your contractor is a business associate, then the covered entity has an obligation to include in the contract with the business associate a thing called a business associate agreement. And that's just some basic contract clauses that say, hey, the information that you're that you have, you're collecting on behalf of the covered entity is protected. You know, you have to follow HIPAA just like we do. It's all of the basic obligations that are imposed on an entity like DHS are passed on down the line. And they they follow the healthcare information as it travels. So you can have three, four, five, six levels of business associates who have to continue to look at patient information to do their work, um, all relating back to the work of the covered entity. And kind of new in 2013, uh, the, there was a limitation on uh, who was covered by HIPAA because it basically the law attached to covered entities. It attached to business associates pursuant to contract. But if a covered entity just forgot to put the right language in a contract to make a business associate a business associate, under the 2003 regulations, that meant the business associate wasn't a business associate. It was all contractual in nature. Uh, in 2013, the feds changed that. And now the regulations directly apply to business associates, whether or not the covered entity screwed up and failed to put the right contract language in the contract. Uh, so the feds, if something bad happens, will come out and look and say, well, yeah, you don't have the right language in your contract, but you were a business associate. Doesn't matter. We're still going to fight for the bad thing that you did. Now it won't go anywhere. Okay. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so HIPAA itself um, protects what is defined as protected health information or PHI, and that is defined in the regs as things that are individually identifiable that relate in some way to a person's receipt of health care, and that may be just. Um, Something like a Medicare card that says, hey, this person has Medicare, that's PHI. So if it gets in the wrong hands, 
from a covered entity or a business associate, then you know that's a breach of HIPAA. Uh, it covers data in any form. The original law was written all about electronic healthcare information, but um, the way that it's interpreted by HHS is HIPAA applies to data in any form. So if you leave a banker's box of paper on somebody's front porch that's got PHI in it and walk away, that's gonna be a problem down the line. So paper, electronic, any kind of storage media, doesn't matter at all, uh, HIPAA applies to it all. Um, but protected health information is only protected when it's held by a covered entity or a business associate. So if you give your healthcare records to a bank, it's not covered um, because that's, they're not a covered entity or a business associate unless they're acting as a business associate at the time. And there are tons of exceptions to all of this. So very complicated. So kind of a quick quiz. Uh, let's say that DHS gathers information about people who apply for food assistance, SNAP. Is that protected by HIPAA? Is it PHI? Anybody want to use the chat box to answer that? Any bold character? Answer a guess. She's doing it. We, we got a, a sure yes. Chris, Christy was the first one okay. to say a sure yes. We got a couple of people following suit with the yeses. Okay. And the answer is no. Ooh, trick okay. question. Trick question. <laughs> because, okay, you think about it, and it comes down to the fact that, uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> food assistance is is uh, is important. If you don't get enough food, you will have a healthcare problem. But um, it's uh, the the food assistance itself is not healthcare information, and so the answer here would be no. So this one is my I refer to it as a happy camper analysis. Um, <laughs> so that, uh, a county operates an indigent medical clinic. The clinic bills Medicaid electronically. County also operates a local campground, and the campers are asked if they have any medical conditions the campsite workers should be aware of. So is the camper's response to the question protected by HIPAA? That's a, that's a tricky one. Any, any guesses? Well, I don't know. Have they built out an exception for part of their services? Are they entirely covered? Okay. It's a, exactly where you should think. So, um, is the county a healthcare provider? And the answer is yes, they're running a healthcare clinic. So, they would be covered by HIPAA. Uh, so, the next question is hey, is, have they carved out that part of the, the healthcare clinic away from everything else at the county level? If they've not done that officially in some written document somewhere, the whole county is now, the county government is now covered. Is it healthcare information? You bet. You know, you're asking about someone's individualized uh, health information. So yeah, this would be PHI. So it would all turn on whether or not the county has carved out its clinic from the rest of county government. And we have a lot of counties in Iowa that have not thought this through. So um, HIPAA addresses use and disclosure of PHI. So you can think of use as things that you do with it internally and disclosure stuff that you where you send it out, you're transferring it, you're divulging it to outside entities. So uh, even if you're doing stuff internally with PHI, if you're not doing the right things with it, if you got a chatty Cathy by the water cooler, then you know that can be an inappropriate use. Uh, if you're chatty Cathy by the water cooler around a bunch of guests, that can be an in inappropriate disclosure, and both of which can get you in trouble with um, the HIPAA police. Um, HIPAA is what we call a, a, a floor of protection, not a ceiling. And that means that you can have other state laws and other federal laws that weigh in. And here's a list of just a handful of things that you have to look at whenever you get into a kind of a breach situation. Or when someone asks for DHS information, we have to walk through all of the laws to figure out, can we exchange? Maybe it clears the HIPAA hurdles, but not the other laws. And there are tons of exceptions to HIPAA. So the big one that we deal with a lot is uh, employment records. Uh, things that are sitting in employment records are not confidential under HIPAA. Uh, they're treated separately. Uh, we mentioned FERPA, um, stuff that's not held by a business associate or covered entity. Uh, something that's not related to healthcare, you know, that's going to be excluded from HIPAA. And this is just kind of a nature of the kind of privacy laws we, that we deal with in this country. They're kind of focused on individual areas. It's very different from the European Union where there's a broad-based 
protection of everything that's individually identifiable. Um, the HIPAA regs, I'm going to let Deb and Carla kind of delve off into the specifics of this, but they're uh, within Part 164, a lot of things that you have to do to make sure that you're complying with HIPAA, and that begins with conducting a risk assessment of your organization that looks at how information enters your organization, how it's stored, how it's used by the people internally, how it's disclosed to others, how you destroy it when you no longer need it, and then you have to jump through all of these obligations of training your folks, having sanction policies, uh, having technical uh, frameworks around the data to make sure it's protected. There's a ton that you do, but it all starts with a good risk assessment. Uh, the privacy rule within HIPAA, uh, often the regs, gets into the very specifics of what you can do with a PHI. Um, the general rule is always get the patient's authorization. And if, as long as you're doing what they told you to do with their data, then you're fine. A uh, lot of exceptions to that getting a patient authorization. So you can pretty freely exchange data for things related to what we call PTHO, payment, treatment, healthcare operations. So if you're just trying to get paid, uh, you're just trying to treat the patient, normally there's not gonna, HIPAA's not gonna put barriers in the way of you providing data to somebody else. You can exchange data when it's required by law that you do so. Um, there are some exceptions related to law enforcement and when you can disclose stuff to the police, but it's actually pretty narrow in what you can disclose and when you can disclose. So you have to kind of consult an attorney to figure that out when the, the issue arises. Uh, one of the big issues that was addressed in the HIPAA regs from the very beginning is, is this idea that, well, just because you're entitled to disclose or use data doesn't mean that you should open your data source to whatever this use or disclosure is. You should really just disclose the minimum necessary. So be more um, circumspect about the, the data that you're handing out. Make sure that you're just giving out the stuff that's really necessary for the purpose. Uh, other obligations include whenever you have a contract that requires access to PHI, you put that BAA language in there. Um, for a covered entity, you need a notice of privacy practices. You need to make sure that patients have access to their information and they, they can amend it when they find problems with it. There's just a ton that you have to do to meet the HIPAA obligations. New in 2013 is this concept of a breach notification. And so probably a lot of you have gotten notice from Anthem or any number of healthcare providers that something bad happened and your data got out and here's what happened and here's what we did about it. Um, and that's all coming from these 2013 regulations in HIPAA. So uh, the obligation is every patient that's impacted has to get a letter. Uh, there can't be any reasonable, uh, unreasonable delay in sending those letters out. It all has to happen within 60 days of the time that you knew or you should have known about the breach. Uh, if there's over 500 people impacted in a in a state, a jurisdiction, but it's it really means a state. You have to notify the Secretary of HHS within 60 days. You have to notify all media in the impacted area within 60 days, and that means Des Moines Register, not Juice. You know, <laughs> uh, can't, get, can't get away with that. So, um, and all of that's laid out in new regulations in Part 164. And there's also yearly reporting to the secretary of any breach, even if you just sent one letter to a wrong party. You know, you you write a letter to that individual, but you also have to notify the secretary at the end of the year of all of those incidents. And they are investigating anything that's over 500, they investigate. If it's under 500, we're starting to see some investigation activity there as well. Uh, also in 2013, the criminal sanctions were cranked up a lot. So if you look down kind of middle of the page there, uh, if you do things and you, you act knowingly uh, and uh, do something bad under HIPAA, that can get you a year in jail and $50,000. If you act with false pretenses, so you're lying about who you are, you uh, and you see this every now and again where a nurse uses somebody else's uh, credentials to log in and look at Tom Cruise's last hospital visit. You know, that's using false pretenses. That can get you five years in jail and a hundred thousand fine. And then if you are attempting to sell data or personally gain, um, like um, threaten somebody with their healthcare information, that's quarter million dollars and 10 years in jail, federal jail. And then on the civil monetary penalty side, uh, they 
in 2013 cranked up these numbers a lot. So civil monetary uh, civil monetary penalties begin when you act with willful neglect. That means you will get a penalty if you act willfully and neglectfully. And that's a kind of a low bar. That's, you know, eh, if, if you just didn't conduct your risk assessment and therefore you didn't set appropriate policies and procedures or you didn't train, that's kind of willful. Um, and that means you're going to get fined. Uh, the civil monetary penalties go up to one and a half million per year per provision of HIPAA that's violated. So one thing that you do wrong may result in 10 different provisions of HIPAA that you violate. So, and if you do that for an entire year, that's 1.5 times 10. So um, a lot of money is at stake. There are some affirmative defenses that you can assert, but some of these, you, one, you can't act willfully. Uh, and two, you have to correct the issue within 30 days. And that's, again, from the time that you knew or should have known about the issue. So um, let's say your computer firewall goes down. And, well, if you didn't do that willfully and you can correct it quickly, you're still going to have to send patient notices uh, for those that are impacted. But you might be able to avoid some fines through that uh, activity. There's also some state attorney general enforcement authority. Uh, from a state of Iowa perspective, we don't see a lot of that because uh, our state AG does not have independent authority to conduct investigations except in narrow areas, and HIPAA is not one of those. And so we can write somebody a letter saying, what'd you do? But, you know, if they don't respond, there's nothing that our AG can do. There are some good resources online. So uh, right on HHS's website, uh, you can find a lot of information about health and uh, information policy, and they have a frequently asked questions uh, for, I think, one for consumers and one for, for professionals. But the one for, for professionals, if you can find key words uh, of kind of uh, your concern of the moment uh, and type in the search box there, you're probably going to get a fairly good answer from the feds. Uh, there's a great deal of concern in the modern era about the use of any kind of cloud-based infrastructure. And the more that we look at things, um, the more that we see that uh, cloud is impacting what we do. So for instance, we, uh, we had a phone system that was being implemented for the Medicaid program uh, just in the past few months. And kind of unbeknownst to certainly me, uh, the recordings of the recordings of the, the phone calls were going to be stored in the cloud. And so we had to do a lot of research around uh, whether or not this uh, permissible HIPAA perspective. So uh, very good information about online about uh, how you protect things that are in the cloud or protect your mobile devices. Uh, HealthIT.gov is a great resource. I don't work catching some feedback from somebody, and I cannot see where it's coming from. It's just an open mic. Okay. I'm almost done with I think we muted a couple people. Okay. Thank you. Uh, even better advice is, uh, yeah, nothing good <laughs> comes from hitting reply all. Um, email is the bane of my existence. Uh, most of the major breaches that DHS has had to deal with uh, over time have dealt in some way with email. And somebody uh, maybe through a spear, spear phishing effort um, or, uh, or something of that kind, uh, email is the most difficult to deal with, particularly when people store everything in the world in their email. So if you're sending around unencrypted emails that sit out there somewhere forever, uh, realize you're creating a hell of a problem for yourself. Some uh, examples of the new enforcement authority uh, that CMS is using. And so this is uh, the Office of Civil Rights uh, are kind of the police for the HIPAA, and that's the Health and Human Services, the federal agency's arm called the Office of Civil Rights. And so these are enforcement activities by OCR. Uh, Affinity Health Plan got fined 1.2 million because they failed to erase the hard drive from a discarded printer. So a lot of your printers and copiers and things like that, they all have hard drives in them. And uh, there are folks out there who are interested in buying that old stuff and seeing what's on it. Uh, 344,000 patient records were exposed because of that. Concerta Health Services was fined 1.725 million just because they had an unencrypted laptop containing patient information. And we see this over and over and over that uh, 
organizations are not encrypting their mobile devices. That everything that we hear from the federal government uh, says over and over and over, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. If you've got your devices encrypted to 256 um, bit encryption, and you're, you're making sure that your passwords to that encryption are well maintained and not put on a post-it note with the computer so anybody in the world can open it, um, then uh, even if that computer is lost, you can still convince the Office of Civil Rights that it wasn't a breach under HIPAA because the data was secured. So encryption is the key to everything. Another example of uh, Physicians doing bad things. Uh, so here's a, a university hospital who had to pay $4.8 million in a settlement to the feds because a physician developed a nice little app that didn't have any technical safeguards and 6,800 patients, I think it were ER patients, uh, their information got posted online. And that's you guys. Okay. Right um, right so with that transition, some of you may be thinking, okay, so how does this impact me? I don't, I don't, I don't provide medical services. I don't see patients. Um, many of you, especially if you're doing home visitation and family support work, um, many of you are affiliated with hospitals. Some of you are affiliated with local public health entities. Um, really, if you're not sure whether or not you or your specific division or unit of your uh, agency are covered, you know, good time to ask. Um, and find out because I would guess a lot more of you, well, we are, and by, by nature of the fact that you're contracting with us, you are, uh, but whether or not you have thought about that or had those conversations in your office, um, I would encourage you to go back and ask your supervisors or ask your attorneys or ask your physical people or who, you know, whoever um, may be able to provide some guidance on that. And so now we're going to shift from Brad into um, Deb and Carla who work in our privacy and security office and they are going to talk a little bit about what that looks like for DHS contractors. Okay. Thanks Lisa and Brad. Brad touched on a lot of what Carl and I do in the Information Security and Privacy Office for Iowa DHS. Um, we have a security rule that's listed on the current uh, slide here. I, we have the definition of um, the key elements of protecting EPHI and Really, the security rule um, targets all this the technical controls from your IT division. So if you're outsourcing data, um, things like that, if you if you have an, a third party implementing your controls, you know, make sure that you have all of these items, you know, network security, antivirus, uh, multi-factor authentication. Brad touched on the encryption. Um, System vulnerability and penetration testing, uh, web application security scanning. Okay, so this is Carla. So we're going to kind of go back and forth. But one of the things that um, the basis for a good security and privacy program is a risk assessment, and and Brad touched on that. So in this cartoon, before I say yes, I like to carry out a risk assessment. So this is something. If you think about it, this is something we do every day whether I want to, should I turn in front of that car, should I buy this house, it's really one of those things. You, what, what, is, what's the, uh, what do I want to do, what are the pros, what are the cons, and can I live with that? So for example, um, just to kind of put this in simple terms, I want to buy a house, $300,000, it's more than I originally wanted to spend, what could happen? Um, well, maybe I'll have to eat out less, but my budget will be fine, and I can live with that. Or I won't be able to save money for my son's college as I had as I thought that we would be able to. Kind of a big deal. Maybe you don't want to do that. So perhaps you'll make the decision to not buy that house in particular. But it's something you do every day. Should I eat this? Should I whatever? You're always thinking, you know, what can happen? So in simple terms, like I just said, risk assessment is what can go wrong, how likely is it to happen? what the consequences are and how tolerable the risk is. So can we live with it? What is the risk to our what is the risk to our consumers? And so really the key to a risk assessment is just really at the risk to um, of the impact to consumers, to the organization, and know where your vulnerabilities are and what you need to do. 
So one thing about risk assessments, are they a one-time task? No, they have to be done on an ongoing basis. As we know, technology, storage, processes, operationalization of the task in your office are always changing. Threats are always changing, um, phishing emails, that kind of thing. Um, you always have to guard against things that can happen to the information that you're provided or that you're storing. And, and really, honestly, that really would go for any confidential information, you know, but PHI is, you know, obviously what we're talking about today. So, and Lisa had mentioned in the beginning, people are getting funding from, you know, all different directions, DHS, other grants, whatever. So you might say, with these other funding streams, if we have an audit or internally or with a third party, do we still need to do a risk assessment? And the answer is yes, HIPAA requires a risk assessment. It's not the same thing as an audit. Um, an audit is discovery of what you already have done wrong and you need to fix, but a risk assessment is trying to figure out what can go wrong and getting ahead of that risk so that what could happen doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, a risk assessment is like, what, what is that? What do I do? Where do I get it? You know, that kind of thing. So CMS did publish a risk assessment. I put the link on here for the location of that risk assessment. You can kind of see one tool that's being used so you can get an idea of what we're really talking about in practice. So when you talk about a risk assessment, what should your organization know first and foremost? The main thing is where is your data? Where's the PHI located? Case files, servers, laptops, hard drives, whatever, you have to know where it's located. What format is the data in? Is it print, electronic? Um, as Brad said, HIPAA covers both. It doesn't have to just be electronic. And who has access to the data is access controlled. For example, if you have you know, data on your network, do you have access, do you prohibit access to just the minimum necessary number of people who need that information to do their job? And so some questions to ask yourself, these are all parts of what a risk assessment would contain. All the administrative, physical, and technical controls that Brad talked about, but these are just some of the main ones. They're some of the simpler ones. Um, do you have policies and procedures regarding access to FTI? Do you train your staff so they know what FTI, what P, excuse me, did I say FTI, sorry, PHI, do they know, do they know what to do with it, how to safeguard it, how to destroy it when they're done? That's a requirement. Do you limit access to the minimum number of necessary staff that need access to that information to their jobs? These are all things that you have to do. Um, do you only allow those staff that are authorized to access PHI? If, for example, I'm in the office, I'm, I don't know, I don't deal with PHI, I don't deal with DHS, I don't deal with these contracts. Do I have access to PHI? I might not know where it is, I might not know it's PHI, but by virtue of me having access to PHI, that is not acceptable because I don't need access. You have to control access, you know who has it, and if staff leave the project, leave the agency, whatever, you need to remove that access to the information. Access control is a big thing. And are you ensuring that PHI is not altered or destroyed? That speaks to the integrity of the data that you're maintaining. Some other questions are, do you have technology in place to guard against unauthorized access to PHI transmitted to over an electronic internet? Uh, network, excuse me. So, for example, is your email encrypted? Encryption is a big thing, as Brad said. Even if your email is encrypted, do staff know that the subject line of an email is never ever encrypted? So, you should never ever ever put confidential information in the subject line of an email, client name, whatever. Um, so, those are all things that you need to do and train staff then on how to use, you know, those safeguards. Um, is your email stored in the cloud? Do you have a business associate agreement with the cloud service provider? It, it, are the emails stored in Google Cloud? If it is, you know, that's one thing. If you have storage of data somewhere, you have to have a business associate agreement, as Brad discuss, is discussed, that covers their responsibility to 
um, safeguard the PHI just as it is your responsibility to safeguard the PHI. These are just all simple things that, you know, it's just not something people think about. Do you have multi-factor authentication? So if you have system, laptop, whatever that you can that you use to access PHI, do you have multi-factor authentication? Do you have more than just a password? So you have your user ID, password, and say a four-digit code or something like that that changes all the time and it's and it it, it identifies you two different ways. So if somebody gets your password because you accidentally or incorrectly put it on a sticky note, then you've got the other um, authentication tool that um, that person wouldn't have. Are your laptops encrypted? Again, we cannot speak to that enough. When you, I would say nine out of 10 breaches or incidents that we have in DHS are because of staff error. Generally not on purpose, but it happens. None of us are perfect. So you want these controls in place so that you can um, avoid a breach of client, you know, a client's PHI. For example, you could say, I have a laptop in my, in my car, I'm just gonna run into Walmart really fast, come out, it'll be fine. Um, it's on the back seat or it's in the back seat, I forgot. Um, I should have put it in the trunk, I forgot. We have had this multiple times, or you'll see it in the news multiple times, cars are getting broken into, laptops are stolen very quickly. Um, you get out to the car, it's not there. If it's encrypted, that is well, why you don't want that to happen. It's not an issue as far as access to that PHI because it's encrypted and the, the bad guy's not gonna get into it. Does your agency limit physical access to only authorized staff? So for example, if you've got an area where you've got paper PHI locked in cabinets or in a locked room or something like that, do you limit access to only those people who need the access to the PHI to do their job? You must do that. You can't just leave the office open to everybody because again, they may not know it's PHI, whatever, but they have access and, and that's not something that they can have. And particularly, um, do you have policies and procedures in place to specify proper use and access to workstations, mobile devices, and electronic media? So simple things, do your staff lock their computers when leaving their workstations? Do you have a policy stating this? Do staff know that's the policy? Are your removable encrypt media encrypted, USBs with flash drives? They must be encrypted. Are user passwords complex as in a phrase like, you know, ILTMH $45 sign or something? You know what phrase, what, you know what phrase those letters stand for. Um, are they complex, changed periodically? Do staff know not to share them with anyone, even a supervisor? It's not acceptable. Yeah, so those are just some things to think about. The, all those questions are just kind of getting you a sense of where you have some vulnerabilities, but again, a risk assessment is much larger. But think about it, when you leave here today, you're always running through these things in your mind and it's really the same concept. Absolutely. And um, to start like some HIPAA compliance, I'm, I'm going to breeze through these slides fairly quickly because I want to leave enough time for questions. But um, a risk assessment, that is going to be, if you have a breach and HHS OCR comes to evaluate you or based on a complaint, it doesn't have to be from a breach. The first thing they're going to ask for is a risk assessment. Where is the copy of your risk assessment? And that's where a lot of the fines are coming from, is because these entities do not have them. Um, so we, we're going to talk about social media risks. And you know, as we all know, you know, disclosures made on social media concerning patients' protected health information without their authorization is a HIPAA violation. Um, we're going to um, focus on Facebook. And um, yeah. Uh, Facebook sites, um, a lot of our individuals, even our, our own DHS, they, we want to have a Facebook site. And for our, our Iowa Enterprise Medicaid, a few years ago, we had a Facebook site where when MCOs started, people could write in comments, ask questions. And for their website, 
um, they had a comment section where they could write in their own PHI. If there is a comment section where they can write their own PHI in, they will. They will write questions about their their fathers. My father's on Medicaid. He has a disability. He has and and we found out that the third party that was managing that was not a HIPAA covered business associate of ours. So we had to go back through and review all of those comments because it doesn't matter how we get the data. If they offer it to us and it's in our system, we have to protect it. Um, so Facebook, we never want to sign. Um, um, Facebook will never sign a business associate agreement with an entity. They will never sign a business associate agreement. You never want to communicate via Facebook Messenger. Um, and once social media, you know, once the data is out there, so the social media platform owns the data, not you. And the second slide we want to talk about is do you have a social media policy um, for your employees? That's really important because you, you know, you want employees to understand what their rules are at home, outside of work, um, sharing photos, even talking about their day at work can lead to a breach. Let's move on. Okay, so here are some security incident examples. So, you know, one of the, the reasons you have a risk assessment is so that you can avoid these um, incidents. Um, and, you know, as I said, nine out of ten of these um, come from staff, whether they want to, you know, they try to or not, they don't, but it's just, it just happens. We're not perfect. So we need to make sure that staff are aware, they have the policies and procedures in place, and they're trained and all of that, so they understand what to do with the data, what not to do. So unauthorized access to data, release of information, lost or stolen laptops that are encrypted, mailing errors, abuse of privileges, violation of policy, all of those things. Um, just to protect yourself, I'm sure you've all encountered the email phishing. We're going to touch on this. Everybody is very, you know, click happy, we like to call it. Um, stop clicking links. Um, you know, stop opening attachments before you read. And here's an example of a phishing. If Carla wants to move to the next screen. and there's just some clues for you to look at. Um, the fake sender domain. Um, it looks like it's coming from PayPal, but it's really not. Um, look for bad grammar, uh, content, and if you hover over different suspicious links in there, it will tell you exactly what it is and it's not accurate. So think before you click. Um, that's another way to minimize risk. Okay, and just as just a slide, uh, DHS is a really strong incident reporting program, and so we uh, like to think of ourselves as incident <laughs> first responders, and we have those across the you know DHS. But we do have a specific form that's filled out. We need those immediately from staff, and that's the expectation. And again, if they know what they've done, what happened, then they can you know fill this out and know to report it. Um, and then uh, Brett touched on this briefly, but Office of Civil Rights is our, our police, and um, we, we whether we have a breach of one person or a thousand or ten thousand, whatever, we have to report that. Any complaints get reported. They will investigate complaints and breaches over 500, but again, we're seeing some under 500. And I will tell you, as Deb says, they pull, they don't just come and look at that one thing, they pull back all the covers. How do you train staff? What is your sanction policy? Do you have policies and procedures? And the biggest thing is have you done a risk assessment and mitigated things that you identified in those assessments? And, so, and we are constantly under review by right. HHSOCR, constantly. Right. And this last slide just covers, you know, what what organizations should be doing to develop an information security and privacy program. It starts at the top, um, security-wide culture and oversight, you know, develop incident reporting, train your people, you know, have people involved in information security and privacy. That's it. So with that, we have a whole seven minutes Sorry. remaining for questions. No, that's okay. okay. Again, um, I just kind of want to remind people, I know this was a lot of information. 
Um, and, and it was being recorded and we will get um, that information out to you so that if there are people who have missed it. But again, just want to remind people who are thinking like, okay, well, what does this have to do with me? Or I, I you know, I'm just a family support worker. And, and I encourage people to, to take the just out of that as a family support worker, especially if you're working in an agency that is a HIPAA covered entity, if you're working under a grant for DHS, um, really you do have all of these obligations. And so we want to make sure that people feel that they are equipped, trained, understand the policies, um, go back to your organization if you're not sure and ask, ask the questions, um, ask what the policies are, make sure you're really comfortable with them because in this day and age with technology, we are really quick to, um, you know, go to what whatever seems easiest or, you know, I can't get a hold of my family so I'm going to look them up on Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. Sounds like a good easy idea but but, but the potential consequences of that action are, are huge. So what questions do you guys have um, about your work as family support workers or, or in, you know, Brad and Deb have very limited knowledge about sort of um, the transition that we made to, to the DAISY system, um, but that is a huge thing that, you know, being really mindful of your login information and not downloading or exporting a lot of data because a lot of times that gets saved right to your computer, not yes. necessarily a secure place. So um, I'm not seeing anything coming in the chat box. I'm kind of killing time and talking, but you are welcome to, to enter questions into that chat box. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself at this time. Um, we have just a few minutes left. So um, these, these, these folks in the room know what they're talking about and they're the people I go to. So you've got five minutes left to pick their brain. <laughs> and I, would, I would just add that um, once there's some breach and it gets reported to uh, OCR, uh, I think that they come in with a view that if there was a breach, then something was wrong with your compliance program. And so they're just there to identify what you did wrong. Uh, and usually it kind of focuses back poorly on, did you do a valid risk assessment? Because if you did that and you addressed all the concerns that you found, then how could there have been a breach? So that's their mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite dangerous for entities like us that have to comply with HIPAA uh, because it's easy to do something wrong in the process. Uh, and I think the, uh, the other kind of cautionary tale is for years, the largest fine that OCR handed down was 5.5 million. There were a couple of those. There were a couple of 4.5s and 4.8s. The new one is the Anthem breach where, um, some IT folks got fished. Basically, they they gave away their credentials because of a phishing expedition uh, by email, and uh, hackers broke in, and I don't know how many records were exposed from Anthem. Um, that fine was sixteen million dollars. Well, it was eighty thousand Iowans. Eighty thousand Iowans. Yeah. So um, nationwide. It was a nationwide breach, and that's just the fine. That's not, you know, you still have to send a letter to every patient that's impacted. You still have to, uh, if it, you're talking about a breach of Social Security numbers or something that could uh, cause financial harm to someone, uh, an obligation to make sure that the uh, uh, you provide um, credit monitoring and the like. So, question? yes, we have a one question, a couple questions. One is access to the slides. Is it possible to send oh, those yeah, out? Sure. We Let, we'll take out some of the the animations and send them. Okay. Yeah. Even if you do PDF, you can PDF. Yeah. yeah we'll. Yeah. And, and so we will get the slides out. And the other question was you pre you briefly touched on the Facebook issue, but didn't you really go into the risk. Can I, you please explain a little more in detail? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I just didn't want to run out of time. Um, you know, the risk is. Facebook is not secure. It's not on your system. It's on Facebook's network. It's on their system. And if you're interacting with people on Facebook and you put in inadvertently, you put in protected health information, you know, oh, my dad's on Medicaid. I need some help. That's, that's a breach. You're going to have to send a breach notification letter because that data is shared with um, Facebook. Yeah. So like if you're sending a, uh uh, instant messages with uh, the people that you serve even though you're not posting it on Facebook it's quite dangerous because from a HIPAA perspective you need to um, you need to be able to document for an OCR investigator that you've investigated the entire chain of communication and wherever that that instant message is going to go and be stored that you've investigated that facility and you can confirm that it's all secure 
And we don't have the capability of doing that with Facebook. They will not respond to no. you know, our requests for a confirmation that they, they hit any of the, the major standards. So our follow-up to that was, is scheduling appointments considered a breach? Um, Man, if you could keep it to the absolute bare minimum, it's, but it's so hard to do that. I mean, a patient. You don't have control it. over what they define. That's, that's right. right. That's yeah. right. And as soon as they delve off into, I, I've got to reschedule because. I have a medical appointment. I'm yeah. Sick. Yeah. I'm yeah. sick. Uh, Billy broke his arm. I can't go. Yeah. You're off into PHI. That's that right. you just received in an unsecure fashion. So what do you, how do you address that? Um, another question, and then we are pretty much out of time, but these are great questions, and, um, you know, hopefully we can kind of continue this conversation as, as we, you know, go forward in the next few years with, with the contract. But one question was, as contractors, what safeguards do you recommend to people in regards to forms that they can use to ensure HIPAA is followed? Um, I, I, I will just take a crack at it. At first, I was going to say there's some resources that um, Brad talked about. The, the HIPAA um, website for professionals is a great place to start with questions. DHS has some forms. You're welcome to look at that Absolutely. and see if that's something your agency wants to take on as a policy. Yeah. What you start with is those policies. So, you know, you start with a policy and make sure that your staff are aware of the policy. They understand, um, you know, we just revamped our our network user policies yeah. so um yeah that's where you start but if you're looking for resources um you know definitely you're welcome to to look at what dhs's breach notification looks like absolutely um, anything else that you guys can think of of resources so just follow up the questions and we can follow up yeah too. yeah if there are other questions that um we are right at 11 o'clock so if there are other questions or things that as you're kind of processing some of this you think of um feel free to reach out either to abby over at prevent child abuse iowa or or you can um, you guys most of you know my contact information as well um and with that i will say thank you and um, be looking for some of that follow-up information to come. Have a great day. Thanks.